questions. My name is John Pfeffer. I'm a Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies, and I also direct the Global Just Transition Program. And I'm delighted to welcome you here to our event today, looking at the global economy from the point of view of sustainability um, and post-growth alternatives. Um, we're, we have a very exciting panel here uh, that I will introduce shortly. Uh, and the structure of our um, event today, basically our panelists are gonna give some very brief uh, comments and then we're gonna uh, open that up to some conversation among them and some questions from you as well. Um, and uh, it looks like attendees can chat now. So if you uh, can introduce yourself on chat so we know where folks are coming from, it would be interesting to learn uh, where in the world we have attendees. Um, before we uh, begin the, the short presentations, I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Here in the news in the United States, of course, uh, we have uh, the dire forecasts of the, of the GDP uh, declining 0.9% for the second quarter, which has uh, raised a number of fears that we are either currently in a recession or about to enter a recession. Um, and two days ago, we got the news from the IMF, uh, their gloomy outlook that uh, economic growth for 2022 was only gonna be 3.2%. So that was a reduction from their earlier forecast and only 2.9% for 2023. All of which is to say the growth, economic growth is still the kind of dominant paradigm, the dominant way we define economic progress and progress in general, um, the health of an economy. And that's something we're gonna challenge here uh, today. Um, and uh, it's, it's somewhat strange, of course, that, that economic growth continues to be this kind of yardstick of, of progress, given all the concerns about climate change and the recognition that climate change is a result of uh, economic <laughs> growth over the years, um, as well as some of the evidence during the COVID pandemic when we had an economic shutdown, that there were some virtues to, uh, to either a steady state economy or even uh, a decline in economic growth. Now that has translated into various verbal um, acrobatics. Uh, in other words, the description of growth as sustainable that we should pursue a, a, a more environmentally conscious economic growth or that growth should be catch up growth growth for the global south, uh, whereas the global north uh, should observe uh, restraint in economic growth so that there's greater equality. But nonetheless, economic growth remains the kind of centerpiece of our of mainstream economic analysis. And today we're gonna kind of challenge this concept from a variety of different perspectives, both from um, folks who are working in academia as well as folks working in the activist world and in the spectrum uh, that connects the two of them. Um, I'm going to introduce folks one by one uh, before they speak. Um, and I'm also gonna put their uh, biographical information into the chat so you have that for you. Um, and uh, I'm going to then go in reverse order because of course we are challenging you know, mainstream conventional paradigm. So we're gonna go in reverse alphabetical order and we're gonna start with Ashish Kotari. And uh, many of you know Ashish as uh, a founder of Kalpavriksh, an environmental, uh, environmental NGO from India. And he coordinates Kalpavriksh's program on alternatives. He has served on the Indian government's environmental appraisal committee on river valley projects and expert committees to formulate India's bio Biological Diversity Act and National Wildlife Action Plan. He's also the author or editor of over 30 books, including very recently Pluriverse, a post-development dictionary. So we're gonna start with you, Ashish, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, John. Uh, you can hear me? 
Okay, thanks a lot, John. Thanks to IPS and everybody else who's uh, put this together. Wonderful to be with you all. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, so since you've got a very strict five minute time limit, I'll, I'll get straight into it. Um, I think uh, I'm not gonna talk about the various kinds of uh, local to global crises we're in. I think we're all familiar with them. Many of us are facing those crises, whether, whatever part of the world we're in. Uh, and of course, the uh, those who are already marginalized in society um, in terms of poverty or other kinds of discrimination uh, are the ones worst affected. We know that already. Um, I, I'd like to make two sort of broad points. Uh, one, that one of the things we're confronting is not just the problems, but also the so-called solutions that are coming to us from the same systems that have created the problems in the first place. Uh, and these are mostly band-aids. If you look at, say, carbon trading or net zero, most countries in the world have said by 2050 or 60 or 70, we will be net zero uh, in terms of carbon uh, or the various kinds of techno engineering uh, sorts of uh, solutions that are being offered. And to my mind, actually, even sustainable development in many ways uh, are very superficial ways of trying to deal with the multiple crises we're in. Um, and they don't, uh, for the simple reason that they don't actually go to the structural roots of the crises. These roots can be found in either uh, much older systems of patriarchy, racism, and so on, or newer systems of capitalism and the nation state uh, domination and others. Uh, and also the, 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 this whole uh, notion that human beings are at the center of the universe, so the anthropocentrism that uh, we see in the last few centuries, especially. Um, and these so-called solutions do not actually challenge these fundamental roots. They, act, they in fact tend to sustain them. They greenwash them, they redwash them, and they tend to actually sustain the same structures. On the other hand, uh, what we also have are much more fundamental, much more systemic um, transformative solutions that people are emerging with, uh, are coming up with, especially people on the ground, indigenous peoples, local communities, neighborhoods, uh, villages in various parts of the world, both in the uh, villages and in towns, both in the non-industrial and also the industrialized parts of the world. Um, there is a resistance, which to my mind is very much part of those alternatives where people are saying, we don't accept this anymore. We don't accept racism anymore. We don't accept uh, that big mining extractive projects are necessary for uh, well-being. We, we will resist them, we will stop them. And just to give an example of why I think these are alter, al also alternatives is because um, like the movement in central India against two very large hydroelectricity projects 30 years back said, we don't want these projects not only because they will displace our villages and destroy our livelihoods, uh, but because the river on which these dams are being built is our mother. And we will not allow our mother to be shackled by your dreams of progress. So you actually see in these resistance movements, alternative ways of, of being, of acting, of dreaming, of relating to the rest of nature and to each other. But along with that, there's also the second kind of uh, alternatives, which are the constructive ones, where people are trying to meet their needs and aspirations in ways that don't trash the earth, and don't create the kind of huge inequalities that we see in today's uh, society. There is the, uh, you know, the worldwide, uh, the social and solidarity economy, for instance, the democratization of the economy itself, the worker led production kind of systems, the cooperatives, uh, et cetera. Um, there are movements for sovereignty over basic needs, food sovereignty, energy sovereignty. Um, where communities are saying that these are the sorts of things that should be in our hands, in our collective hands, not in the hands of the nation state and definitely not in the hands of corporations. There are the movements for self-determination, indigenous people's self-determination, movements like the Zapatista and the Kurdish movement, which say uh, that we will be the ones who will govern our communities and we will do it in ways that are much more equitable and fair and, and just. And we, we don't believe at that even there should be a nation state. Insofar as there is a nation state, we will make it accountable. But in our areas, we will in fact govern. There are the movements for gender justice, for, for justice for so-called disabled people uh, and various other movements for, for equality uh, and, and fairness. Um, and I think underlying all of these also the movements for 
reintegrating ourselves within nature. You know, we've got this in, in Western modernity, this divide between humans and nature. Um, even the way we speak, we say humans and nature rather than saying humans and the rest of nature and sort of trying to understand that we are very much part of nature and, and that we are a circle of life, not this pyramid. I remember in school, I was taught that we are a ecological pyramid on which human beings are right on top, but actually that we are a circle of life in which all species have, uh, have, have equality. Uh, and so the rights of not just humans, but also of nature. Um, and what this leads to also then is very fundamental questioning of what it means to be human. Does it mean more and more and more material possession, retail therapy, as they say, or does it mean much better relations with each other, much fairer relations with each other, much better relations with the rest of nature, with other species? And so challenging consumption and the incredible and gross inequalities that we have in society. And there, even the Green New Deals that we see in the US and Europe uh, and South Korea and so on, um, have to be challenged. They have to be understood. I think they're very progressive in many ways, but they're also very regressive in some ways. And we see, I think just today, the announcement about uh, the senator in the US suddenly turning back and saying, I will support the climate, uh, President Biden's climate deal. Uh, but then if you look at the, some of the fine print of it, I haven't examined it closely. Some of you can tell me more about it. Uh, you actually see, okay, we will shift to electric cars. And we even uh, uh, Sanders' the New Deal was all about, okay, every American will have an electric car and not a fossil fuel car. Sounds good, but then where is the mining going to happen for those electric cars? Again, there's that whole global south-north inequality and patterns of consumption that are not really being challenged. So my final point here, and I can elaborate that later in the discussion, is that while we have these amazing examples of alternatives all around the world, what we need in order to create scale, in order to challenge the mega structures we're up against is much greater horizontal networking amongst these different initiatives. To, to, the scale is not about upscaling, not about replication. It's about what I call outscaling, learning from each other, creating those horizontal networks of solidarity, which then create the critical mass to affect those larger changes. And I can talk later on about some networks that we're involved with, which attempt to do exactly this. Thanks, John. Excellent. Thank you, Ashish. And I'm, I, yes, I'm very interested in this concept of outscaling. So um, uh, I'd be interested in following up on that later. Um, our next speaker, um, and thank you, Ashish, for being very conscious of time that you've set a great example for everyone. Um, Dorothy Guerrero is uh, the head of policy and advocacy at Global Justice Now in the UK. She currently works on and writes about corporate accountability, climate change, migration, trade and investment, China, and other related economic justice concerns. She's originally from the Philippines and has lived in the Netherlands, Germany, Thailand, and South Africa before moving to the UK. She previously worked with the Transnational Institute, African Women Unite Against Destructive Resource Extraction, and Focus on the Global South. Thank you, Dorothy, for joining us today. Thank you, John. Um, hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us um, this afternoon, early morning or midday to your, to your time or, or late evening, early evening. Uh, I'm aware we are on four time zones. I think I will I will start with saying that that coming from, from the global south, coming from the Philippines, I very much agree with uh, Ashish's uh, point. And, and for us on a campaign perspective as well, and looking at alternatives and promoting those alternatives, um, I will start also with what are the, the ways that uh, movements and communities and also progressive researchers and, and, and policymakers uh, or those lobbying for, for good policies, uh, the, the important aspect is how do we challenge the rules of the, of the game? I mean, the, the rules of the trade, finance, investment regime uh, to address the climate chaos. So at the moment, we are at this point where at least there's a consensus that uh, the climate change, the global problem requiring glo global solution based on justice and solidarity. That's the first agreement that I think is universal. Uh, although there's the climate denier, deniers, but uh, there are many, many reasons where why people see it as a global problem. 
And then second, which is also gaining uh, a wide acceptance and, and also support, is the issue of living fossil fuels in the ground, um, that it has gained legitimacy and it is seen as the most viable um, response to climate change. There is also a political consensus among activists, movements, scientists, key people uh, about this uh, solution. And the other side of that is how to put re renewable energy as part of the solution. So renewable energy is now seen as something that must be um, um, fast track in, in, in places where it can be fast track and also developed in places where it is not yet developed. There's also thirdly, um, on, related to that, an increasing consensus about the need for the phase out of fossil fuels. Um, uh, although in the, in the climate negotiation, they are not yet in that kind of agreement, but there's also the aspect of how will that transition, because it is important to look at how do we do the just transition uh, or, or just transition based on, on, on solidarity and justice as well, or social justice. Uh, there is a view that uh, the management and control of the sectors that will, that will do the just transition at the same time would need uh, to be discussed as well. Who will manage it, what for, and who will benefit? And there are needs to acknowledge uh, certain conflicts when we discuss this. Uh, one, we need to be clear that there are conflicts and these conflicts have two fundamental dimensions. So one is an interstate conflict, uh, north, south, center, periphery, rich, poor countries, and also there is an interclass conflicts. And in these conflicts, the poor majority, the marginalized, the women's voices and agenda are not in the top priority. So it's, a, it's important to, to have that clear and how to make those uh, voices be heard more and more often. And also both are essentially about who will reap the benefits of the transitions adjustment and who will pay for the cost of the adjustment. There's also the question about the need to address current climate emergency in, in, in the ecologically unequal exchange between core and periphery, and to imagine a post-capitalist, eco-socialist future hand in hand with the socially just alternatives. For some, it is the growth. For some, a more global Green New Deal in the North. Uh, for, the, for the South, all the various alternatives that focus on solidarity, sovereignty, communing or commons, uh, which is all focused on life, which is more important that when we talk about the economy, the focus should be on life. And many of the post-development um, systemic alternatives are discussing that kind of transition, uh, which is beyond growth and then also uh, post, um, post capitalism, especially at this point when we are when, when, when you are at the stage where we need to face and address the, the issue of monopoly capitalism. Um, I mentioned that because that's our issue now in the in the in the people's vaccine, where we could see that life-saving vaccines and medicines are seen as a as a as a good for profiteering by corporations. And the pace of the transition process, its scope, the depth, and the degree to which the transition process well, would be, whether it's orderly or disruptive, um, market-led one or regulated whether it is peaceful or violent process will be determined by the conflicts. And, and it is, um, it is uh, key to see that the outcome will be determined by the balance of forces in society as well as on a global level. So I am putting forward this question of, of conflicts because for me, uh, I think it is enough, it's not enough to wish and, and to work for alternatives, but to be aware that the stronger those alternatives are and being promoted and supported, the greater would be the forces against them or against or, or to crush them. That is one reason why some of the progressive alternatives, uh, when they go to election, they're not voting because um, the, 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 the forces against them are crushing them. So how do we also prepare for, for such kind of, um, of, of action against these kind of alternatives? 
So I think I will also stop there and I will look forward to the discussions later. Excellent. Thank you, Dorothy. It was, it was very interesting how you began with the, the consensus views, but then you, you ended with the conflicts. And that's really important. To, to This is the reality principle we have to apply to our discussion because conflicts are inevitable. And I think we're going we're gonna to do a lot of, uh, of digging down into those questions of, of conflict. Um, you also raised the issue of uh, leaving fossil fuels in the ground. And that brings us to Colombia and the new um, Gustavo Perro administration there and their promise to, to do precisely that. Uh, and so we actually have uh, our next presenter from Colombia, living in Colombia at the moment. And I'd like to introduce Catherine Nora Farrell. She's an ecological economist and political theorist. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Natural Sciences at the Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. She's an internationally regarded expert on the topics of monetary valuation of ecological phenomena. She's the author of more than 30 international high impact scholarly articles and, and has held the prestigious research funding awards of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and the Marie Curie Fellowship Program of the European Union. And Catherine, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am going to, if I can, share a few images. Uh, I suppose it's a bit of a generational thing, maybe. Uh, so, and uh, I sort of try to pass through those images while I am uh, uh, going through my uh, comments. So uh, this is the first image for those of you who haven't seen them yet. Uh, for me, it's a stunning image of the photo of uh, Pope Francis wearing an uh, indigenous headdress that was placed on his head by the representatives of the, co the Consortium of Indigenous Chiefs of Canada. So this is an act that's uh, ritualistic and powerful and very symbolic. And uh, in a way, it's the main thing I want to say we need to deal with reconciliation, we need to deal with peace and, and apology, uh, embarrassment, shame for the horrible, horrible things that have been done. And I, I think it's a very powerful image for us. Uh, that being said, and as uh, was just mentioned and bearing in mind uh, recent events, I understand it's expected that I should have some words to say about what's going on in Colombia. And I will say a little bit, um, but not because Colombia is exceptional. I want to speak about Colombia because Colombia is a microcosm of the contemporary world. Um, the violence and brutality that has characterized Colombia for the last 50 years is the violence and brutality of this planet and the way in which we have gone about managing the Anthropocene. And this election is historic by any measure. And we have Gustavo Petro, the president-elect, an ex guerrilla with degrees in environmental policy and public administration from Europe, and Francia Marquez. And so if we just, uh, I want to move to this uh, other image. The idea that you're looking at a, a, a Wikipedia page that has a picture of Gustavo Petro and says, president elect of the Republic of Colombia underneath is just incomprehensible to a huge number of people here in the country. And I think it's for us also to keep in mind that we're in a moment of massive change and transformation, and it's an opportunity if we choose to take it. Um, so that's uh, Gustavo Petro, but uh, another part of the story, and, and this photo really tells us a lot. This is Francia Marquez, Gustavo Petro's vice president, uh, winner of the Goldman Prize. And uh, she's an individual, and this, this photo is really powerful. And that is Francia. Uh, you get what's on the package. And she's angry, and she's right to be angry. And the people of the Choco are right to be angry. Uh, this is a mega biodiverse uh, region full of environmental riches, very rough terrain and illicit activities, a lot of violence. And it's inhabited mainly by poor people who Marquez in those days leading up to the election began to uh, appeal to. And there are people who say it's the reason they won. And she said, if you are a nobody, vote for me because I am a nobody. And this is gonna be the government of the nobodies. Uh, they have also put together an incredible coalition of individuals in their uh, new government. And it's uh, these are just a list of names. Um, I don't have time to go through the differences, but what I can tell you is that the array of individuals involved is enormously broad-reaching, 
And the government program is to deal with introducing agricultural and tax reform and managing the existing economy. And, and that's the next point where I want to focus. So um, the situation that we're looking at in Colombia and the economy is typical of the planet in some respects and not in others. But the question of agriculture and how we are going to manage agriculture, I would say, is also very much bound up with the war in Ukraine right now. And there I just wanted to mention, because we were asked to touch on it, the question of Belarus, which is one of the major suppliers of phosphorus on the level planetary uh, agricultural industrial system. Um, so in, in that respect, I want to touch on that. I think Colombia is at a crossroads, but that the world is at a crossroads. And we've been here before. We were here with the rise of national socialism in Germany. And we were also here in Colombia with a period that's referred to as la violencia or the violence, where there was a brutal, brutal feud taking place over precisely how to structure the economy between conservatives and liberals with the people, the nobodies of rural towns suffering the consequences. And so this choice I would like to suggest is this choice of moving beyond the family fight between whether we have a laissez-faire capitalism and wanton destruction, or some type of hypervigilant regulation, which is uh, often accompanied by authoritarianism. So Colombia is now in a moment of having to choose. And I would like to suggest it's a choice that implies making mature decisions and becoming adult about the situation that we're in. And a part of that is asking the question, when and how and under what conditions do markets work and when and how and under what conditions do they not work? As opposed to saying that it's all good or all bad. So the unregulated market can and does generate enormous damage, ecological, human injustices and equality. But in Ireland, we have a saying, uh, there's a saying that says, it's a poor musician who blames their instrument. And this goes a little bit into some of the comments that have already been made. It, markets are anthropogenic phenomena. They are created by human societies and their functioning relies on norms and customs established by human beings. And sometimes they are consolidated into law, sometimes they're not. But these include, generally speaking, fairness, transparency, duty of care and reciprocity. So I'm not defending globalized industrialized capitalism and the havoc that it has wrought. But I want to invite us to reflect on the fact that that's the system that we have to work with today. And this leads me into the question of alternatives. And here I come back to the Pope and the need to foster and practice and promote what I'm coming to refer to as an inter-epistemological ecological morality. And it, just by coincidence, or perhaps not, uh, the scholar I use to talk about this is from Canada and talks about indigenous communities' rights. And she speaks, this is Murdoch, and I have the text if anybody's interested. And she speaks about crimes perpetrated against Canadian First Nations by European colonists. And she uses the concept of ecological violence to contextualize that. And in that way, I think it, it's necessary for us to start reflecting on this intimate relationship between the violation of the physical territories of peoples and the violation of those peoples and the ecologies. And going back into this uh, question of, are we understanding ourselves as part of nature? This inter-epistemological ecological morality is a response to that. And I would propose that it's exactly what Pope Francis was, was exhibitionistically practicing in making his overtures to, to these same people in Canada. And uh, to, to sum it up and hopefully to give some suggestions that are a bit more concrete than we need to be nicer and better people, uh, I think there's a need to take responsibility in social and economic contexts for our role in stipulating the terms and conditions upon which economic systems and processes function. And so failing to face up to this is, is a part of the problem. It's a very embarrassing situation to say, oh yeah, well, I have these good things because you're exploited. And human beings are, are human beings and we don't like being embarrassed. It's hard to be moral towards somebody who you suddenly discovered you have their, your heel on their neck. And they, 
here I'd like to close by moving a bit more into the academic and reminding us all of the extraordinary work of the ecological economist Nicolas Sturgis-Gudrosian. Um, in particular, with his, respect to his question, this question of responsibility, uh, there's a lot to be learned from him. But one of the concepts he works with is the idea of economic anchang, which I convert or translate into purposive economic perspective. What am I trying to achieve with an economic process? And he gives us a lot of mathematical tools for managing that. But he also lays at the feet of us this responsibility to recognize that economic processes are anthropogenic. And so I think we should use more of him. We need to ride him forward. And we also need to link the work of ecological economics in general more closely with moral theorists who are working on issues of subjectivity and questions of responsibility and an the Anthropocene. And I think these are precisely the kinds of issues that motivate activists to get involved. These are the types of issues, this indignance that we see in Greta Thunberg's arguments, saying, listen, somebody has to answer for what's happened, and then we can get started fixing it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you both for the update on what's going on in Colombia, which is, I think, inspiring for a lot of us, but also, you know, zeroing in on a necessary conversation we need to have about the role of the market, which is in some sense separate from questions of capitalism, which is one form of, of market, um, and also the importance of anger and responsibility, um, which I'm sure we will return to. Uh, I'd like to introduce our final uh, speaker. Josh Farley is an ecological economist and professor in community development and applied economics and public administration and a fellow in the Gund Institute for Environment at the University of Vermont. He is past president of the International Society for Ecological Economics. And he's the co-author with Herman Daly, figure many of you know, of Ecological Economics, Principles and Applications from 2010. Thank you, Josh, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So I'll probably be a little bit more theoretical in some of the previous presentations, but you know, our task is to think about how do we redesign the economy for sustainability and social justice. And the first thing I want to bring up that you know, the goal of almost all economists and all politicians is continued economic growth. But for anybody who knows anything about systems and complex systems, exponential growth is always ephemeral. It cannot be sustained in any finite system. It's just this, you know, rapid increase in production of whatever. So positive feedback loops, you know, Danella Meadows is a very famous systems theorist, and she stresses that positive feedback loops, which is exponential growth, must always collapse. And one of the most important leverage points you can have for intervening in complex systems and achieving your goals is dampen down or eliminate positive feedback loops. So economic growth is one positive feedback loop. And, you know, you sh showed the IMF is striving for, you know, or the World Bank, I forget, saying 3.2% economic growth per year. That doubles the size of the global economy every 24 years. In the past 100 years, we've quadrupled the human population and increased the size of the uh, per capita consumption ninefold for a 36 fold increase in the size of the economy. So that can't be sustained. But also, we see growth in stocks and growth in capital in general. So, one of the best selling books of the 20th century, 21st century in economics is Capital in the 21st Century. And it stresses that capital, stock markets, all forms of like just monetary wealth, essentially, grow much faster than the economy as a whole. So not only is this unsustainable, but we're systematically transferring our resources to the owners of capital. Another place where we see exponential growth that can't be sustained is interest-bearing debt. So those who are familiar with monetary systems know that the vast majority of money is loaned into existence as interest-bearing debt. That debt now, uh, public and private together, is approaching 400% of GDP and is growing faster than GDP. So this, again, is wildly unsustainable, and it systematically transfers resources from debtors to creditors, to those the government gave the permission to create money out of thin air, which sounds crazy, but if you do a little bit of research, you'll find even the central banks agree with that. So all of these forms of exponential growth, they're not only unsustainable, they they must ultimately collapse, but they're also wildly unjust and they're because they transfer resources to the few. And we have to redesign an economy in which 
exponential growth does not occur. It's only transitory. You know, I was growing exponentially until I became 18 and I stopped growing. And that's the type of thing. We've reached maturity. We have to stop growing. Other big thing about exponential growth, if you're, you know, if you're the, the allegory of the lily pond, if your lilies are doubling in a pond every day, um, and at 30 days, the pond is full, when is it half full? That's 29 days. So even if we've only used up half our oil, one more doubling period would use it all up. So the first starting point is that, you know, exponential growth simply can't be sustained. The second point I want to stress is the type of problems we currently face in society are social dilemmas. And these are areas where individual self-interest undermines the common good. You know, if I catch all that fish, I get the benefit, even though I wipe out the population and future generations suffer. If I spew CO2 into the atmosphere, I get the benefit, you know, uh, uh, other people suffer. And so this is, instead of the invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about, social dilemmas create an invisible foot where everybody acting in their self-interest kicks the common good to pieces. So capitalism is defined by private property rights, individual choice, competition, and pursuit of individual profit. But for the social dilemmas we're facing for global climate change, for you know, maintaining global biodiversity, for maintaining the ozone layer, private property rights are impossible. They're not even worth talking about individual choice is impossible. I cannot choose how stable a climate I want. Um, competition is crazy in many cases in that, um, you know, if we have clean, cheap alternatives uh, to fossil fuels, you know, through alternative energy, um, we want to make those freely available. We need cooperation. We need cooperation to address global climate change and these other things. So we are faced with situations where the specific physical characteristics of the resources are no longer compatible with a capitalist system. And this is not saying we eliminate capitalism altogether necessarily, you know, as, as Kate pointed out, but rather that we can't rely on it to solve certain problems. Um, so one of these deals is mainstream economists argue that humans are inherently selfish and we always act in our own self-interest. We can't cooperate, which is absolute absurdity. Humans are the most cooperative species to ever evolve. Think about what you had for breakfast this morning. How many people were involved in getting that food to your plate between the truckers and the farmers and the producers of agriculture, uh, producers of fertilizers and farm machinery? Think about that. But then think about how many people were involved in developing the knowledge necessary to do that. And if you think about that, Producing your food requires knowledge of agronomy, of metallurgy, of uh, you know, geology. The, the knowledge required to meet your basic needs every day was generated by billions of people over thousands of years, and humans cannot live apart from society any better than a cell can live apart from the individual body. Um, so humans evolved to be extremely cooperative, and there's this concept uh, an evolution called multi-level selection. So for natural selection to occur, you need uh, heritable traits, you need variation, and you need selective survival. And what we have, the, people always think of genes and DNA is the hereditary mechanism. But for humans, it's culture. It's culture we and culture we pass on to our offspring. It's heritable. It dramatically affects your likelihood to survive. You know, a Maasai warrior is not going to be able to survive in Inuit territory and vice versa. And, you know, uh, you throw an um, investment banker in either of those situations, they're going to die. It's uh, so, and cultures have more, there's more variety between cultures than there is within individuals within a culture. The, uh, what I want to get at here is that humans, natural selection acts at the level of culture. It also acts at the level of individual. So within a society, the most selfish individuals outcompete other individuals, but the most cooperative and altruistic group outcompetes other groups. So we have dual forces selecting for self-interested and cooperative behavior. And what we do to create cooperation is we develop morals and ethics and norms that bond us together as a community. These are absolutely fundamental to the future evolution of human culture. What we need to do is evolve to cooperate at larger and larger scales, um, you know, the, the, at the scale of the problem for things like climate change. Other issues can be dealt with very locally. 
but we are the most cooperative uh, species to ever evolve. And we need to intentionally shape our future cultural evolution through choosing the moral and ethical values and norms that allow us to cooperate to solve these problems. Um, and that, that's our task. Um, and we always talk about, we live in the market economy. And I ask my students, you know, what type of economy has uh, most affected your life? And they always say, oh, you know, we're a market economy. I said, oh, really? Your parents charged you for room and board? You know, and that's not the case. You actually, you know, your main experience with my students is in the core economy, which is that economy of reciprocity and gifting and providing for your close kin and community totally outside of the market, a radically different type of market. A I'm sorry, a radically different type of economy. We also have a market economy that's tailored towards individual needs and individual needs only. We have a public sphere or a public allocation sphere that tries to uh, uh, channel resources towards the collective needs of society. What we totally lack and what I think ecological economics is really trying to promote is economic institutions that put the uh, you know, folks on the biotic community of which humans are a part and really try to preserve, protect, enhance, and restore that community. Over the last 50 years, we have been through the neoliberal revolution, we've been trying to take everything from that core economy of gifting and care for your loved ones and from the public sector economy and put it all into the market. We're now trying to put natural resource bases into the market and you know, or natural resource base into the market. And this is just the wrong approach because of the physical characters, characteristics of the resources. We need to flip that dialogue around and start trying to uh, take things out of the market economy and put it into other sectors of the economy. And just as a few, you know, perhaps practical pathways um, when I look at this core economy, where things are done through gifting and reciprocity, it's really uh, for the common good. Um, we need to develop an economy that's main goal is not growth, but secure sufficiency for all. All our basic needs are met. Our planet is too small to achieve much more than sufficiency, meaning that more and more consumption can no longer be our goal. We should instead be focusing on designing economic systems where production is fun. We're collaborating with our fellows to meet our basic needs, gives us a sense of award, reward. But a few quick practical pathways that I think we should pursue. The first is a green knowledge commons where all knowledge that contributes to a socially just sustainability transition is free for all on the condition that nobody tries to patent any improvements. And universities could re should really be doing this, right? We, I've been looking at in the um, my university, we spend $500,000 a year trying to provide uh, get intellectual property rights, which net us, which earn us, 400,000 a year. So we lose, a, we're spending $100,000 a year of essentially taxpayer money to deny the public access to knowledge we produce for the common good. The university then pays me to write journal articles and review journal articles for corporations, for profit corporations, we can't even afford to buy back the knowledge. So a green knowledge commons is a negative cost proposition for universities transnationally, not national, uh, but transnational universities to share knowledge, anything for the public or, or you know, for the socially just economic, uh, socially just sustainability transition is freely available. So that I think is a zero cost approach. Really quickly, I think we need a social media commons. We need to radically transform our cultures. Right now, social media is one of the most pervasive uh, sources of information on our planet, all designed to get you to see more ads, to buy more stuff. And the way they found that they can get you to do that is to uh, have algorithms that increasingly polarize people because that keeps them online longer. So at a time we need cooperation and anti-consumerism, the most powerful corporations are focused on polarization and consumerism. And we need a social media comments, which means that should be commonly administered and with algorithms that get people to focus on ecological limits and social justice. Different algorithms will have radically different goals. We need a monetary and financial commons. Um, which is what some of my students are also working on. And finally, just as a, a last word, um, an, an idea, I think an atmospheric comment, you know, how do we redistribute wealth? We have Elon Musk has so much wealth, but if we just said nobody owns the atmosphere, 
we're going to say everybody has an equal right to emit pollution into the atmosphere at a level that's sustainable with our planet. Suddenly, no matter how much wealth Bezos or Musk has, they can't spend it because there is none of you are looking at or interacting with anything right now almost that did not require fossil fuel to produce. So an atmospheric commons actually by prohibiting people to take what, uh, based on their monetary wealth, to take a shared inheritance from nature, eliminate that, that goes a long way. I think I probably talked, spoke too long. So I apologize and I'll answer any questions. Um, so those are just a few comments. Thank you, Josh, I appreciate that. And you know, your, your comment on you know, the unsustainability, the, the, the multiple unsustainabilities that you outlined, leads me to, to a question I'd like to all ask all of you. And that is that it seems in some sense that the Green New Deal in the North is in some sense a, a way to save the system in, in much the same way that say the New Deal was an attempt to save you know, American capitalism or even perhaps global ca capitalism. Um, but as you know, a number of you have pointed out, Ashish, uh, Dorothy, the Green New Deal has some problems. I mean, where is all the resources going to come from uh, for electric cars that Bernie Sanders has called for, which might emerge under this new mansion um, deal with the Democrats? Um, who is going to pay for all of this? Who's going to benefit from all of this? So my question then is not only um, the nature of the, this Green New Deal, but also the time frame, because Josh, you did talk about evolution and about, well, frankly, millions of years that were used for developing, you know, all of the, the, the agricultural processes, scientific processes that we take advantage of today. But of course, we don't have a million years for the evolution of, of a response to our current climate change. So here we have a kind of a, a conflict, to use Dorothy's language, a conflict between um, the Green New Deal put out there and its problems and its problematic relationship between the North and the South and the time frame that we need to address what is an, an urgent issue facing the planet, namely climate change, among other urgent issues, including biodiversity loss um, and unsustainability in terms of, of, uh, of economic growth, et cetera. So how do we kind of square this circle? Do we continue to move forward with green new deals? You know, do we come up with more radical um, alternatives that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that deal with the problematic nature of the green new deals? I wanna go back to Ashish perhaps and go back again through everybody. Um, and you can answer that question, but you can also respond to other things that folks have been saying. And I encourage our attendees to put questions in the Q&A so we can get to those as well in the next round of, of responses. Thanks, John. Um, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. If scientists are telling us that we only have 10 years left to reverse uh, the climate uh, crisis in any meaningful manner, um, uh, to pose a question saying, well, what can we do in the next 10 years that's going to uh, create that kind of a transformatory revolution? Um, my response is, we can't. We don't, we can't do this in 10 years. This is a multi-generational uh, transformation we're talking about because we're dealing with uh, structural um, forces that have been around for, in some cases, thousands of years, like patriarchy, and in some cases, maybe 500 years, like capitalism. So. Uh, to say that, okay, we can try and actually deal with this in 10 years or 15 years or even a single generation, I think is unrealistic, which means what we need is um, we need very strong efforts at adaptation uh, because uh, a lot of the crises are already here and it is going to get worse. That's the bad news uh, because even if we manage to magically stop all fossil fuel, uh, I mean, all carbon releases, etc. What we've already released is already causing lots of problems. Um, so uh, that's one thing. How, how do we actually uh, significantly um, enhance efforts at especially the most marginalized peoples in the world being able to deal with the kinds of uh, impacts of whether it's climate or biodiversity or any of this, right? So that's one. Um, second, so therefore, we also need transitions. 
And I think there are elements in the Green New Deals or in some of the other programs around the world uh, where, where there are interesting elements of transition, um, where, for instance, from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And so those are things we can encourage. But it's very important for us to try and figure out how which of those transitions will lead ultimately to systemic transformations and which are the transitions which will only entrench the current system. Uh, and to my mind, for instance, a shift from fossil fuels to electric cars is only entrenching the current system, uh, which is that of inequality and north-south inequality and so on. But if we're talking about, say, a transition from fossil fuel private cars to public transportation in a very rapid way, which could well happen, then that is actually a transition towards a more sustainable, trans uh, towards a more transformatory uh, system, right? So uh, I would like to actually see, and we're seeing this, for instance, with uh, not the Green New Deals, but with the Global Green New Deal kind of uh, um, narratives that are emerging, including from the Global North, which are recognizing that inequality and unsustainability and consumption patterns have to also be dealt with. So that's something I think is very important. I'd like to put up, if it's possible, also in, in relation to what some of my other panelist uh, colleagues have said, um, what we call a flower of transformation, try and actually see how do we assess whether a particular solution or so-called solution is truly transformative or not. So John, if it's okay, I'll just put up a, a slide uh, and just share that for a minute. Uh, I lost you all. Um, sorry, can you see this uh, full screen? Okay, uh, I mean, this is just uh, a favorite map of mine because it's so decolonizing where uh, Europe is uh, shown to be its actual size and Africa is shown to be its actual size and England uh, disappears. Uh, anyway, but uh, this was just to actually also put up the fact that there are there are all these fantastic alternatives, both practices and worldviews around the world. But I wanted to really show this one. So uh, this is something we use uh, here in India is to actually say that if, um, how do we assess that something is really a radical alternative or a systemic alternative, right? And we, what we say is that it needs to be able to work at these different, uh, in these different spheres of life and all the intersections between these spheres. It needs, for instance, to be able to move towards radical forms of democracy, of self-determination of what we call Swaraj in India, or as somebody put up in the chat, uh, things like Ubuntu or Buen Vivir. Uh, it needs to move towards economic democracy, what was spoken about uh, by my friends about the economy of caring and sharing uh, and, and worker control and uh, cooperative and social and solidarity economy and not GDP as the indicator of progress, but things like does everybody have clean water, does everybody have clean air, does everybody have good adequate nutritious food to eat, do we all have voice in decision making, do we have good learning opportunities, etc. Along with that, of course, social justice, because you cannot have a localization, economic and political localization, uh, without also the struggles for gender justice or justice for LGBTQ or sexualities or so-called disabled people, and, uh, et cetera. Um, then, as also was previously spoken, the incredible importance of uh, asserting cultural and knowledge diversity and knowledge commons. Right, uh, Josh spoke about uh, so many of the commons uh, that that, we, that are very important: the atmospheric commons, the intellectual commons, etc. And against intellectual property rights and the privatization that's taking place of both culture and knowledge, and the homogenization that has taken place over the last five hundred years. So against that, and underlying all of this, of course, ecological wisdom, uh, which is what I spoke about earlier, kind of integrate reintegrating ourselves within uh, nature. And at the core of this is something that, again, I think all the panelists have spoken about. You know, we, uh, when I say outscaling, what I'm saying is that you take any of the most radical alternatives, let's take the Zapatista or the Kurdish movement or indigenous self-determination movements in many parts of the world. Um, you can't replicate those. Okay? I can't pick up the Zapatista example and say, I'm going to copy this in India and, and, and be successful. But I can learn the lessons. And I think the most important lessons really there are the values that these initiatives uh, embody, 
right? Uh, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly. Um, I think it was Joshua who spoke about cooperation as being one of the most important in, in evolution and in including in human society. I remember going back to having read uh, many years back uh, Kropotkin's uh, Mutual Aid, incredible book where he actually showing that from biology to human society, it is actually cooperation that has made the evolution possible, not competition. And of course, the misunderstanding of Charles Darwin, which he brings out. Um, or epistemic uh, uh, transformations, which which uh, Catherine spoke about, um, and and I think it's it's actually being able to learn and exchange these sorts of values and ethics and principles, and create the networking amongst ourselves that would help also to deal with the challenge that Dorothy posed to us at the end, which which is very very true that the more successful alternatives become, the more the system is going to hit back and threaten us and challenge us. We're seeing this all over the world. People are actually being killed as they pose these resistance and alternatives. And so it is through that horizontal uh, uh, creation of solidarity networks around the world that we will become more resilient and be able to affect that those sort of larger changes based on uh, uh, the understanding that there's a pluriverse of ideas, ideologies, ecologies, politics, uh, economies, etc., all of which are important and worth respecting insofar as they are not undermining any other ecology and ideology and polity, etc., right? Um, but what, what we bring together, what, what threads all of us together, I think, in this pluriverse is uh, values and principles of this kind. So to my mind, I think uh, trying to focus much more on this uh, and using all kinds of different languages for this, right? So Ubuntu, Buen Vivir, Swaraj, Kyosai, Shahaj, I mean, our book Pluriverse has about 90 examples of these uh, and, and respecting all of these. And my last point here, if I might just add in a little uh, naughty point here is that, and this is something I always uh, ask my uh, degrowth friends because now degrowth is becoming the new export all over the world. It's like the solution to uh, growth is degrowth. And I always sort of push back and say degrowth is very, very, very important for you people in the in the global north, but it's not the it's not the uh, solution here. What we here have is Swaraj, which is very different. What we have somewhere else might be something very different. And we need to look at what are the interconnections, what are the common values, but not say, well, okay, now this is the global solution uh, in any one of these. So, thanks. Sorry that response may have been a bit. Long. Thank you, Ashish. Um, Dorothy, I want to I want to go back to you, and especially on this question of of the rules of the game, getting getting voices from resistance uh, to help reshape, rewrite the rules of the game, um, but also um, you know uh, bearing in mind as uh, as you said that there is going to be resistance to the resistance, and how do we? How do we address that resistance to the resistance? Yeah, I, I think before I, I respond, before I respond to that, I I thought I was was muted. Um, well, I think like like the growth, the Green New Deal is also facing opposition or or uh, and also uh, and also resistance from the from southern movements and also governments it's because. Yeah, it is it is seen as, as a northern approach, as a northern alternative, and it's not global enough. So it is indeed the big task of the Green New Deal politics to break down um that that box that it is a northern alternative, and also to break down the prevailing neoliberal form of environmental politics that pits workers against environment on the earth, or jobs against environment. Um, in the global in the global south as well, we can't talk about transition or alternatives without questioning and dealing with the question of ownership. Ownership is an integral factor in that debate. Nationalizing the fossil fuel industry is a major debate, as many governments are faced with with threats of investments pulling out. Um, so any conversation that doesn't put things like nationalization on the table, um, that would mean the terms of transition are left to fossil fuel executives. And then at the same time, these fossil fuel exec executives would be more than happy to abandon whole parts of the enterprise if they're no longer profitable. So this is also a question when, uh, and this is another part of the debate, 
not all fossil fuel is also bad and not all renewable, renewable is automatically good because the question of ownership lies there in the heart of it. The some are saying the early years of the Chavismo uh, government were in um, the use of fossil fuel earnings to finance uh, the needs of the community, the, the uh, feminist bank was, was ways, and also to help the other partners on the so expanding South 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 Alliance uh, on, on fossil fuels. So it, it is more of a question of uh, or the fact that we could not do the transition overnight. So while we are discussing and debating about transition, at the moment, what do you do with existing fossil fuel um, mines and then all those? So it's a question of first take control of it because if you don't own, you, you can't you can't control, you can't design, you can't you can't um, change something that you don't own. So a big question of, of nationalist, nationalization of those assets. And second, uh, we have seen in the example of Mexico with, with uh, wind energy, it is in the hands of multinational corporations. So that is why I said that not all renewable energy is good. So it's a question of who is it for, what will it be for, what will be used, that, what will be that energy, uh, energy for. So this acknowledgement that um, it should be built up. It, it is also, we need to clarify who will build it up, how, where, and, and for what purpose this will happen. And, and also there is a, um, a, a trend as well that fossil fuel companies are presenting themselves as a key player in renewable energy build up, but they are not actually investing on the development of renewable energy. So they, so in that sense, they're, they're like uh, the, the wolf presenting themselves as, as the sheep. Um, or our grandmother in the in the fairy tale, uh, ready to gobble us up. So which countries? That's also a question. That again, I will go back to the north south divide. Which countries control the knowledge, infrastructure, and control of patents and technologies, and will export them? So which which countries will import them, and in what commercial terms? So these are important because in the negotiation, when we in the climate negotiation, when we talk of technology transfer. The big problem there is all these technology have patents, like in the vaccine question. So, so a question of how will those, how how will the global south go around the question of patents is another, maybe another issue, another debate, another forum. Um, because it will it will answer which countries will dominate world trade in the sector, and which countries will will be excluded. We could see that in in the in this transition, it's also a major rivalry between countries. U.S., China, Germany will dominate uh, the renewable energy technology sector, while countries like Haiti, Senegal, Bangladesh uh, will not be in the picture. So the outcome of these conflicts will be greatly determined by the wider power structures within the world economy and its interstate uh, system, and will be determined by the economic and political bargaining power that individual countries have with one another. So uh, back to the question of how do we fight? Um, I, I think um, one, I, I, I often say this, that one weakness of the left is that we are being, we are so good at being oppositionist or being in the opposition, but it is so difficult um, when it comes to us governing. And, and um, there are, I, I'm, I'm sure there are many, many discussions in Latin America now uh, with with uh, with with um, Colombia, uh, Bolivia, and 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 hopefully Brazil as well, Peru, Chile. Um, the big question of will it be the pink tide again, or will it be more for red than the pink? Uh, the uh, question of what were the economic uh, problem before that were not addressed because politically, um, there was the it is a, it was a success, but on the economic terms, the question is even. Even the radical governments um, did not make very radical changes on the on the economic aspect because they are also scared. They were also scared of being crushed, and they will be crushed. And that's the, that's a problem. And um, you know, economic sanctions, also the U.S. Um, not wanting them to succeed. Um, so I think there uh, there will be no no no. Um, I I think the the answers are being built, but the. But at the moment, the more important factor is when we think about the debate as well, bringing back the question of the state, because there had been a period when many movements 
um, I, I don't disregard totally the the you know the the small the the, the independent uh, because they 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 have roles. But when we talk about transition, we we it has to be in a certain scale. It has to be in the national level, and there should be national ownership. Uh, so there there are roles for the small is beautiful, but big is also beautiful because that is how. We, we control the, the global uh, geopolitics and, and power relations. Thank you, Dorothy. That's very helpful to, to bring the conversation back to what level are we talking about when we're, we're talking about transformation. Um, and, and I think all of us have, have uh, contributed alternatives at various levels, at the local, at the national, and at the international. Um, Catherine, I, I want to turn to you and perhaps following up on what Dorothy was saying. I don't know if you have some uh, some responses, particularly about um, the left, you know, coming back to national power in Latin America and what that might mean in terms of policy transformation, beginning in Colombia, potentially in Brazil and other countries as well. Um, yeah, I think I think it's an interesting issue, and I uh, I, I agree with my, much of what's uh, been said um, so far. I, I also want to take issue a little bit with one of the the points, but I, I think it's complementary uh, relating to what you've just asked. This is this. Uh, so for me, the idea of the left and the right is is passe, and I know that that can be an uncomfortable argument, um, and I, I don't mean it to dismiss people who are deeply committed to working on issues of social justice and identify themselves as being on the left. Um, I feel you have the right to identify yourself and there's a huge history there that it makes a lot of sense to people and makes more sense in some contexts than in others. Um, but for me, looking at the, at the planetary level and looking at, um, because we really have achieved this and that's the idea of the Anthropocene, we are now being confronted with coping with the human species as a planet level relevant instance that's that's causing these these planet level problems that we're encountering at the moment. And I, in that respect, I want to come back to this uh, idea of uh, reconciliation. And I, I was looking at some of the comments in the chats. And um, this is a really, really difficult thing to manage. And I think um, one of the problems, and I, I agree very much with what Dorothy said, um, as people who have spent a lot of time in opposition saying, this is bad, we can't do it this way, you have to stop, suddenly find themselves in a position of authority, it's a difficult transition. And it's a transition, I, I look at the case of Rafael Correa in, in Ecuador, and I was a huge fan of the Yasuni ITT project when it was first launched, and a, a huge fan of this discussion. And then, um, one of the things that I see, though, there's two things in Korea, if I can use him, and I think he, as, a, as a scholar and, and a person of political concern, uh, he won't mind being used as a rhetorical device. Um, part of the, the issue in that particular case is that the product that was being marketed was badly designed. Uh, so this is something I've, I've worked on a bit that, so uh, Ecuador was selling in the uh, Sunni ITT project the products of um, compensation. And, but they weren't selling it in terms of saying, okay, you're gonna have to have a regulatory control that says for every ton of oil that you use, you have to somewhere keep a ton of oil in the ground. And if there was a regulatory mechanism that had constructed that incentive, there would have been a market. But instead, Yasuni was selling something that they didn't have on offer and uh, they were selling the carbon compensations, which is in the trees, not in the oil that stays in the ground. So I, I mentioned that just as a technical point, because I think we need to, uh, as the opportunities arise on the global scale to be able to open up these discussions, people are paying attention to ecological economists right now, and they're saying, oh my God, 50 years ago, you were right. It was about to happen. Uh, sadly, 25 years ago, I was saying, I don't think we've got 50 years. I think we got 20 if we're lucky. And, and that's what we got. And uh, so there's a huge opportunity now and it is a great responsibility. Uh, it's very difficult to, to be noble and dignified from the position of having been so badly treated. 
And here, I think it's not just about the Pope, it's also about these incredible indigenous leaders who said, okay, you came here in good faith to apologize and we're not going to rub your face in it. What we're gonna do is tell you, you are like us. And we're gonna do that in the most uh, majestic and, and, and symbolic way we can by giving you this headdress. That is, you're not allowed to wear this headdress if you haven't earned it. And so by giving him this headdress and placing it on his head, they said, you have earned our respect. And I think that that's a duty that exists on the, if you want to call it the left. But the other point, and I'll, uh, I'll close on, on this because it comes back to what's going on in Colombia, but I think also at the planetary level. And um, I really do not think that it's very helpful for us to be talking about left and right. And we need to start building much better coalitions of people who are concerned with planet blows up, planet doesn't blow up. Because this is really the, the issue at the moment. And I, I, I think that means dealing with questions of fiduciarity and company design, which is an issue I've tried to work on, and the personality of a corporation, the personality of an investment project. Uh, because the issue that we, exists at the moment, I think is even much uglier than we imagine. The, the worst case scenario that I can imagine is that ecological destruction and ecological recuperation become a business. And that the destruction of ecological substrates for exploitation is then followed up by another sector that goes in and takes investment to recuperate. And there's a upper echelon of economic monetary accumulation associated with exposing people on a, a random and capricious uh, basis to that uh, type of a life. So I really think we have to start um, building different types of coalitions, I guess, the sort of final comment. Thank you, Catherine. And perhaps that ties back in with what Ashish was talking about in terms of horizontal um, coalition building. Um, I wanna give Josh an opportunity to, to respond. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time. I wanna thank Ashish for answering some of the questions that come up in the Q&A, which is very helpful. Uh, others of you can kind of delve in there and, and answer as well. Um, uh, but Josh, in addition to, to um, you know, responding to, to what other folks have said and kind of reflecting on the Green New Deal, there was a question that um, someone posed, which was about, um, you know, countries in the global South, like India resorting to coal and other fossil fuels as kind of the major source of, of energy at this point, especially um, uh, coal now, given uh, what's happening in Ukraine and the, the loss of uh, natural gas and oil imports from that part of the world. Um, what can they do uh, different? How can they catch up or how can they have, uh, you know, a, a, how can they rebuild their economies along sustainable grounds without resort, resort to fossil fuels? Right. And I'm going to, I'll answer that. And I also want to touch on some of the first questions you asked, um, you know, this idea about, for example, electric cars, um, you know, I really am a big believer in uh, secure sufficiency. Rich people fly and drive, middle income people bicycle and take public transportation and poor people walk. We have to be aspiring for sufficiency, which means maybe, maybe electric bikes for all. And, you know, this is also part of the deal with with India, you know, burning coal and everything. Um, and, and again, there's a comment that Rigo made in the chat, you know, it's not North versus South. There are plenty of fabulously wealthy people in the South and plenty of desperately poor people in the North. And it really is, why don't we just be blunt about it? Rich versus poor or the, you know, um, and if, if India aspires to achieve the standards of living of in Western countries, um, you know, it's the standards of living, it's, um, not going to make it but quality of life we sacrifice enormous amounts of our quality of life to buy more stuff we work absurd hours we spend time away from our families we don't have time with community you know we're sacrificing all that to buy more stuff so it really is a radically secure sufficiency of a radically different goal and endless growth and you know and the social connections and everything that could really be promoting this positive vision of an alternative world um, is more what we need to be focused on. You also made a, a point about how, um, you know, well, it took, you know, millions of years to evolve. And how do we do it? So 
genetic evolution takes a very long time, less time than people used to think, but still a very long time. But cultural evolution can be astonishingly fast. Take a look at World War II. You know, we went from being a, a capitalist economy. How many cars did we produce in Detroit in World War II? Zero for the public. You know, the government just took it over. And uh, we suddenly we rationed everything. We had rationing on food, rationing on gasoline. And people accepted that. People recognized we have a serious challenge. We stopped focusing on individual needs and started focusing on collective needs. And we did it astonishingly fast. I mean, you know, we just, and, and I think a lot of the rationing, you know, people are always into these free markets and everything, whereas rationing is often just a far superior solution. Um, and one quick example of that, you know, California had uh, Enron and these uh, oil companies got together, agreed to take electric, electric power offline, knowing that it would lead prices to skyrocket. So we see a tiny decrease in uh, food supplies and um, oil supplies because of the Ukraine war and prices skyrocket. Same thing with, um, you know, any kind of essential resource like energy or food. So, you know, so the skyrocketing prices like disrupted the um, you know, the economy and political system of California that led to, you know, uh, uh, the governor got thrown out, they elected um, uh, uh, Schwarzenegger. At the same time, Brazil had a worse elect uh, crisis because their hydropower had a major drought. They said, no, we know how much electricity you consumed last year. You're going to assume 10% less this year because that's how much less energy we have. Price will stay the same. Zero disruption easy to do. It just shows that many of these things we use, like in World War II, like rationing, are far superior to the market, far less disruptive, far more fair. And I think, and we've proven that we can adopt those at an incredibly fast pace and a very large scale if people recognize the seriousness of the problem. And, uh, you know, so again, I think that countries are going to have to realize that we do live in a finite planet and this pursuing Western gross overdevelopment in which people aren't happier, aren't more satisfied with life, you know, and so people are sacrificing their well-being on the altar of consumption. And, you know, there's that's not a path forward. Um, so I think that the countries like India, um, you know, they could meet the basic needs. They could attain secure sufficiency with probably a lower ecological footprint than they have. Um, but it's, uh, that, I think that has to be the goal. Um, I don't know if I actually answered your question, but <laughs> well, it wasn't my question, but thank you. That's yeah. useful. Um, okay. We have 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to do here is basically do a lightning round to go back, um, and give you all a chance, uh, which would factor out to approximately two and a half minutes each. So be mindful of that. Uh, just to respond to whatever. I know, uh, Dorothy, you already kind of responded in an interesting way in chat. People should take a look at that. But you can, you know, Ashish, you can uh, elaborate on the horizontal networks. You can reflect on the question Josh was uh, grappling with on um, other uh, energy sources in India. But you have two and a half minutes. We're going to go right in the same order we, we started in, beginning with Ashish. Thanks. Yeah, uh, no, I think uh, what Josh has posed is, of course, a huge challenge. Um, but I think what we see uh, in terms of a lot of the grounded initiatives here is that people are not, uh, people are actually enhancing their uh, well being and their living standards uh, by focusing on things like food and water um, and doing it with, uh, you know, significant levels of uh, or very different kinds of energy systems. So decentralized renewable energy where you need energy to, to be generated, but also looking at energy in very different ways, passive energy, uh, human energy, bio, uh, bio, fuel, bio sources, not biofuels in the commercial sense, but bio, biological sources. Um, uh, and, and actually trying to say that how to, for instance, what kind of agriculture uh, can we do, which requires very little external energy inputs? Right, so we have 5,000 Dalit women farmers in South India who are growing um, not just enough for their families, but also enough to uh, sell a bit in the market and to provide for food relief during the COVID pandemic uh, on completely um, uh, uh, dry land uh, farming, only rain fed, uh, their own local seeds, uh, absolutely no external inputs in terms of fertilizers and chemical pesticides and so on, their knowledge, their labor and, and so on. And I think those are the sorts of, and that's just one example, but those are the sorts of things we'll have to look at. I just came back from 
the uh, northernmost uh, Indian territory of Ladakh adjoining Tibet. Very, very cold there. And there's two models that are coming up there. One is these mega solar projects being built by corporations in the name of climate, India's climate pledges, et cetera. And the other is decentralized passive solar. So actually making buildings using some traditional and some new technologies where because there's 350 days of sunlight there, you can actually be able to just trap that sunlight in the day and it warms you in the night, even when it's minus 20 degrees outside. So it's two very different approaches to, to looking at energy and, and lifestyles and well-being and so on. These are just some, some examples, but I think we need to go down those pathways much, much more. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Dorothy. Well, I think for, for my last, we call it pabaon in Filipino, like, like something you leave, you leave uh, as a gift. Uh, I think uh, it is important for climate justice movements, uh, also those those working alternatives, uh, especially those pushing against fossil fuels to also develop or increase our solidarity with mineral producing countries. And we have not discussed that here. It is important for, for us in the movement to, to know the history of OPEC, for example, because there are struggles how OPEC was built and, and also support the social movements that are working to increase the democracy in their countries and that also are located in those OPEC, OPEC countries, all producing countries. Uh, we also need to address the need to avoid making the workers and, and communities in, in, these, in those countries to weaken. So I, I, I was saying in, in the solidarity, this is one contradiction. This is one thing we have to, we have to address. So both, and this is both in the political and economic terms, because when we talk about transition, somebody will will pay, and 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 it most likely it, it is those that don't have bargaining power or don't have or don't have the voice, and and I think um uh this is another topic that we are campaigning on um climate reparations, and I think it is important to look at it. It is the cent at the center of climate justice struggle because we need to highlight uh the need for developing sophisticated and above all historically informed. Uh, approaches that confront both climate change and imperialism simultaneously, colonialism and imperialism. Because now that here in the UK, that is gaining track uh, among the young people who are seeing the role of the UK in colonizing countries, extracting resources from countries, and, and impoverishing those, those countries um, by doing so. so. So I think when we look forward, how do we also look back and, um, and, and be mindful of the faults and the consequences of the past and how can we correct it. Excellent, thank you, Dorothy. Catherine, two point, two and a half minutes for you. Okay, uh, well, I try to be succinct. Um, my sense is that uh, one of the major uh, topics that comes up over and over again in our conversation right now is the question of time. How much time do we have? Uh, how long did it take to get here? I would add to that, uh, we need to understand that uh, our perception of time is, is, a, is a neurocognitive phenomenon that transforms and shifts and changes, and that different cultures have different ways of looking at time. And so I think it, there's, there's things that can happen very quickly and there's other things that cannot happen very quickly. And it's important to, to be conscious of that. And um, the other thing I would like to just touch on is, is this question of the identity of the firm again, and the, the way in which uh, in the beginning, in the lead up to the Nazi era, there was a discussion about the necessity for capitalism of that era to be reconfigured and restructured because it was inhumane. And the people who were involved in those early processes knew that they were building something that was inhumane. And that is something that I think we need to not lose. So there is a, a great degree, degree of right to be indignant about what's going on at the moment. And I think there are many, many people who are in seats of power and privileged who are conscious of that or capable of becoming conscious of that and that that needs to be made use of. And uh, so then I guess to, to bring it to a close and to try and uh, uh, give some coherence, I come back again to this question of reconciliation. And it's not just because I have reference of Colombia and Northern Ireland, um, but it, it's also because the, the 
the damage that's been done is so brutal. And until we're able to, as a species, as a consciousness, as, a, as global communities, uh, comprehend this great tragedy, uh, I don't think that we're in a position to really pick up sticks and start working on how to get beyond it. And um, so I, I would come back to that again. And uh, the Dalai Lama talks about compassion. Um, and there's a lot of different words for it, but it's this question of being able to put down and move forward. Excellent, thank you. Josh, two, min two and a half minutes. All right, yeah, so very quickly, I would like to say that, um, you know, I, I'm very interested in evolution and we talk about genetic evolution among humans and it's uh, or among most animals and it's vertical. You pass your genes onto the offspring. Bacteria actually swap genetic information called plasmids. And in times of stress and difficulty, they do so much more radically. And that is where I see humans. Culture also swaps ideas horizontally. It's not vertical descent. And we can grab ideas from other cultures and we're in a time of extreme crisis and we need to stop, start like grabbing a bunch of different ideas out there. This is the pluriverse idea. And there is no one solution to our problems. Different uh, cultures and different ecosystems will require very different solutions. Um, and what we really need is, it's way past the era of natural selection. We need to select ourselves, but we still need, none of us know really how to change the system in the right way. We need to try wild varieties of policies and institutions and programs and have very rigid criteria for selecting which ones are working and which ones are not. I view the criteria, the goal is, you know, a socially just sustainability transition. And uh, so we need to try a bunch of things, select what works for that goal. And just a final comment on social sciences are radically different than the natural sciences. We're not trying to understand how the system works. We are trying to transform the system. And it is our goals that attract us to one perspective or another. And uh, you know, even if the neoclassical economists perfectly understood the system, I would abhor it because their goals are the wrong goals. We have, we need to choose the correct goals, which I would say at this point has to be that socially just sustainability transition and empirically test all our policies and institutions against that goal. If they work, improve them. If they don't reject them and recognize that every region of the world is gonna have different solutions to these problems because we're all different cultures and different environments. So a plug for the pluriverse idea, I guess. <laughs> Excellent, thanks, Josh. We've had a tremendously uh, you know, interesting conversation with lots of insights uh, that have been varied and, uh, and really I, I've been uh, very stimulated by the conversation. And I, I, just to close, I would say there has been an interesting consensus uh, among all four of you, I think, and to go back to Dorothy's identification of different levels, a tremendous number of alternatives at a local level. Um, and as Josh said, alternatives that we can learn from in a, as, as the plasmids <laughs> do horizontally by transferring information and adapting it within contexts, uh, individual and local contexts. Um, but at the national level too, there is an imperative for a transformation at a national level, for, seize, for having political power to make those transformations. And it is possible to see a transformation in culture as a result of a shift in national policy over a period of time, which perhaps, and I know Ashish was pessimistic about being able to do a transformation in 10 years, we can see at least some progress within our lifetimes. And then at a global level, and the, the importance of um, a, uh, a something along the lines of a global Green New Deal, though we would never use those terms, we would prefer to use global just transition. And at the heart of that, what uh, Dorothy was talking about, which is climate reparations, which is another way of what Catherine was talking about, which is reconciliation. Because what is climate reparations, but a form of reconciliation between not so much North and South, uh, although it may look that way, but between rich and poor, um, as, as others have pointed out. So I think there's tremendous consensus among what we have talked about, all four of us here on this panel. I wanna thank you all for your contributions. Uh, we are going to uh, make this video available. We'll write this up as well and post it at our website at Global Just Transition, which I put in the chat. I wanna thank all of the participants uh, all of the attendees uh, for your very interesting questions. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. So 
take care from the Institute for Policy Studies. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thank yeah, you, thank you, everybody, for your attention. And I'd uh, love to hear the other talks, those.